Friends, we're going to lean in because we've got a full night of um, hopefully what will be something that leaves you better than the way it found you. And I'm excited about this lesson for many different reasons, um, and I'll get into that. But first, I want to see if we have prayer requests or uh, praise reports. I know we want to lift up Trina and the family there. Everybody uh, is a little under the weather. Um, and uh, hopefully, Trina, you can, one, one person can at least do a, uh, a COVID test because I think even if you got COVID now, they can even prescribe something to make the uh, symptoms less, even, even less than what they are if you're vaccinated. So uh, might want to. Yeah, uh, I just, I have been getting on all of us in here. He, that's what he wants. He wants us to take a COVID test. So I yeah. do have one, so I'm going to take it. Oh, good. Okay. Awesome. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests. Of, yeah, Michael. Just a small um, prayer request for Pastor Steve. I heard Lewis say they went by to visit him the other day, and he was, you know, you know, a little bit rough time. So prayer for him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any others? All right. Well, with that. Um, I'm going to lift up a praise report um, and uh, the two prayer requests we've got, Trina and the family and uh, Reverend Lewis. And then I want to lift up Trina and uh, also a praise report, Trina and Thad celebrating another anniversary. And also Candace and I celebrating the big 3-0 what? How many hey, years Pastor, for you? Th three oh for us too, Pastor. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah, I knew there was some connection along the way. Praise God. So uh, we've got that in common, and we praise God for that, and also praise God that uh, we were able to visit Bria this Sunday. And uh, I tell you. Uh, yeah, I want y'all to know there's some folks that still worship two and a half hours long. Yeah, we went to worship with Bria. Praise be to God. She found a church home that's uh, the pastor's anointed. They've got uh, well over 100 uh, college students that attend. Um, the membership for this church is like 30,000 on the website. And uh, just you talk about what's possible and uh, to dream bigger and uh, and yet walk in your anointing, whether it's 30 or 3,000, what just a blessed time. And we just left on the wings of angels uh, inspired. And uh, even now this week, um, uh, when I'm able, uh, I, uh, when Candace and I are able, we take a, some time away and work remotely from uh, the beach for our weekend, our week. Um, and when I have to come by myself, I spend the time in uh, solitude with uh, my heart open to where God is leading and to develop plans for the future and uh, so although Candace is at home and uh, the, she's the one thing missing from where I am, God has provided uh, insight uh, into um, how to allow his spirit to, to bless folks in the days ahead. So we're praising God for that. So let me say welcome. Welcome, uh, Joseph. And uh, I want to also say uh, what a uh, fantastic job on Sunday that you did in uh, using your gifts and talents in worship. We appreciate you um, and we appreciate um, all that um, transpired on Sunday. I'm trying to, uh, and uh, as always, Sally, when you are there, you add a component of worship. I'm trying to remember when I heard you Sunday or last Sunday. I've got you in my mind, but uh, I lose track of time. But 
Come it off me. Sunday. I think it was okay. both. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, and I just praise God for you. I praise God for your capacity to sing from your anointing, your place of experience. To the extent that we get to experience God's presence through your giftedness as well. So uh, and want to thank Michael for being on the helm. Michael, I watched remotely and you did a fantastic job. And uh, with all the uh, overlays, as you and I know them to be, and the adjusting in the volume and uh, uh, all the things that you're looking at over there, I just praise God for um, what we can do when we all do something. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, what we can do when we all do something. And so let's pray together as we lean into tonight. Father God, we're grateful for the 12th day in the 10th month in the year 2022, about 707, where you have created time and space for us to experience the chakra, the spirit that binds us together. You said wherever two or more gather, you would put us together in such a way that your presence would be obvious. So we wanna get out of the way and surrender what we see, what we perceive to what you perceive. Yeah. Take our drop in the ocean and allow us to experience the ocean itself. Take our separate anointings, God, and join them so that we experience the totality of what it means to be in your presence and to be a part of you, sons and daughters of the Most High. Leave us better than you found us. And as we lift this up, we thank you in advance for uh, allowing it to come to pass, the flu symptoms and the dis-ease in uh, the household where Trina resides with her family. We thank you for boosted immune systems, even through this Bible study. And we thank you, God, for also knowing that things come to pass and the testimony comes after the test. So we thank you for that. We thank you for Dr. Lewis, who has been in what we will call this, what, what looks like a marathon when it comes to the five patterns of tests that he is in. Allow him to run the course, God, so that he will have the praise and that we will be better off for it and that he will enter into the realm of the initiates who understand the purpose of tests. In short, leave us better than you found us. In Christ's name we pray and we say amen. All right, well, friends, we are going to dig right in. I'll do a review, quick review. Those of you that have phones and uh, computers, I pray you'll take pictures of key concepts. Um, and we'll go into uh, a little more of this on Sunday as a way of review and as a way of praise and tweak it for worship. Um, but I just, uh, in my meditative moments a few moments ago, I thank you for the vision, God, in this series um, as we talk about not only the trials of life, but the patterns that lead from test to testimony, uh, the patterns of tests uh, in this faith walk. We're going to look at some great scripture tonight. Um, I'm going to start off with um, a PowerPoint, and then we will go into the video. And we're going to go right up until 8.30. We might go to 8.35, but I'm going to uh, jump over to the Young Adults Bible Study at 8.30, Candace is prepared to pick up the last couple uh, minutes of the uh, video if need be. Um, but I'm excited for you because I'm excited for where God is taking us in this study and uh, what it might reveal as we develop tools, right? Uh, you know, if I work on my car with a screwdriver, Michael, I can do a couple things, right? But if, <laughs> if I add a wrench, if I add a... Uh, a set of sockets, if I add some power tools, if I add some uh, electronic equipment that I can test this and that, um, the more tools I have, the better I can work on the, the vehicle. And so at the end of the day, what we're trying to work on is our vehicles. How many know that this body is a vehicle and it allows us to experience God three ways 
um, and actually four ways. One way is through our uh, the world coming in, our perception of our um, five senses. The other is through our mind. The other is through our heart. And uh, the fourth is through the very spirit of God. And we're going to be talking about that. What does it mean to perceive, to understand, first of all, we've got two perceptions that we can render into our steps. Our perception and the perception of God. God gave me that last night while here. Uh, he said, son, you can look at what you perceive. I'll give you that option. And I've also given you the option to perceive what I see. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll get into that about halfway. But let me start uh, with uh, a review. And uh, we are going to buckle your seat belts here. We uh, started off and we we're in session one or um, session one, we're in session two here, but let me review session one um, as to the groundwork for where we're headed. Basically session one and two are the groundwork for the rest of the sessions. So let's uh, take a look at this diagram. Um, it was through the process of a stroke that um, this was birthed through the uh, anointing of Bruce Wilkinson, and it led to this revelation, to this experience of being able to look at first the components of the test of faith. And there are five R's there at the bottom. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, and, and this is a way to remember it, on the left of uh, reality is our response, and on the right is responsibility, kind of the same root word. And as James, the writer, who kind of uh, was the backdrop, the biblical context for this construct, um, he started with the response before the reality. Um, and so I will start with the reality and then go back to the response. The reality is that life is full of trials. God allows trials. God sends trials in the form of tests of our faith. And we are not masochists. Masochists are those that love pain. Hmm. We are not in that category. Those of you that watch the series, um, what's the name of that series, Candace? that uh we watched the most of it um but we didn't watch the whole thing um what's the name of it candace where the one guy had these are you talking about ozark no the one that had the masochistic tendencies he was an attorney oh lincoln lawyer no 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 the long one that we watched for several series and uh they uh uh, the b billion billions it's called billions oh, that's the name of the series oh. and one of the characters in there was was kind of had masochistic tendencies he liked pain well we are not uh, uh talking about enjoying the trials uh we're talking about the fact that the trials can be sent by god and uh although grievous and although we experience suffering um, here is this place that uh, James wants us to live, knowing that we can be grievous from a human standpoint, and from God's perspective, we can still have joy and rejoice. These two can be easy to remember because basically James is saying joy didn't do it again, right? Joy doing it again is rejoicing. <laughs> See the word joy, the root word there? He's saying in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the grievance, in the midst of the suffering, you can still have joy and you can even rejoice. And we know that he calls those that are able to do this, right? This is a high bar, right? What do I mean by high bar? It's hard to reach. It takes time to get there. But we can get uh, get there if we have the tools 
right? To tame the body, to uh, turn this and uh, adjust this and uh, uh, allow ourselves to not only perceive what we see, but to perceive what God sees. So from our standpoint, we can see the grievance, the suffering. And from God's standpoint that we can also perceive, we can have joy and rejoice at the same time. How is that? I never will forget about six years ago, my kids were telling me, uh, it's this new language that started emerging. Uh, they say stuff like, uh, you know, I'm positive, almost, or uh, I'm certain of it, uh, a little. And these two words, and then I'm saying, those don't go together. And then I began to understand this new realm of looking at life where they can go together. Grievance and joy suffering and rejoicing, those don't go together. Well, let's take another look tonight. Our reality, um, James tells us, is to first respond in rejoicing and uh, with, re, uh, with joy. And then as we're enduring this, right, our responsibility is to endure. Our responsibility is to endure. If we can trust God enough to endure the trials and tests of faith, then the result, uh, the result is transformation. It won't last forever. It is transient. It is temporary. It has a time clock. And yet during that suffering, during that transition, during that time, we are transformed from where we are to where God is taking us. And we are not in the transformation process. The genuineness of our faith is realized. We're going to look at um, Abraham in a few minutes. This is godly transformation as a result. And one of the things that was uh, highlighted and I hadn't paid much attention before is the reward. Of it. And uh, as it, it's laid out there in James and a couple of other script, scriptures, is earthly and heavenly. There are two rewards. The earthly reward is in the midst of pain, in the midst of bodies that weren't mis meant to last forever in the midst of these bodies, there's something eternal in us that will never die. And often we think of when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Well, there is the possibility of enduring so that we experience heaven on earth, that we don't have to wait till we lay down all of our burdens to experience the joy of the Lord, where we can really sing from the core of our being, this joy I have, the world didn't give it. So no matter what the world sends my way through my senses, through my heart, through my mind, it no longer has the capacity to steal my joy. That is the earthly reward. The heavenly reward comes from Jesus. In the revelation and the revealing and the return of Christ, it says that Jesus will give out certificates. <laughs> Not the kind that we give out in school and get from uh, human hands, but the certificate of glory. What does that mean? Sharing in the glory that Jesus was bestowed with. He's going to give out glory, right? And to the ability that we passed and endure and are transformed, we will experience this next stage of glory with Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's review. Now, session two, the patterns of tests of faith. Now, I'm going to take a minute to get to the test, and I'm going to let Bruce Wilkinson take over for that section and video. But I want to talk about several things, several ground uh, rules or a platform before we get to the tests. And the first thing we want to start talking about is... Um, the uh, ways that we get to know information, right? How do we know something? How do we know something? Um, and there are four four things we want to lift up. Uh, let me raise it up. Four levels of knowing. The first is unconscious incompetence. 
all four of these area we areas we have in our um, being. We all share these four um, ways of knowing. Uh, unconscious incompetence is I am not conscious. I don't know incompetence what I don't know. Yeah. The whole training I did years ago on uh, leadership and self-deception around implementing and developing an outward mindset was about understanding that deception is not knowing what we don't know. There are some things about you that you don't know that you don't know, but other people do, <laughs> right? And there are reasons for that. We won't get into that today, that we block things out of our mind and we become unconscious and incompetent in knowing what, uh, how to move forward in those areas. We all have some areas where there's some self-deception going on. The second is conscious and incompetence, right? Uh, this is where we know areas that we don't know right? We are conscious of things that we don't know. Some of us uh, are conscious that we can't play the piano. Some of us are conscious that uh, we don't develop skills to work on cars. And on and on it goes. We are conscious of things that we don't know how to do. Third area is unconscious competence. There are some things we don't know that we're competent of. You know, everybody, all of us has these innate gifts that we're good at that we don't um, value that much because it's just a part of who we are. We're unconscious that other people, if to get that gift, they would have to work 50 times as hard where we don't have to work at it. It's just a gift. We're just unconscious of it. Sometimes somebody might say something to you, you know, you are so good at this or that. And uh, we can be, receive it like say, like as if, you know, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Um, uh, and not take it to the depths of the compliment that they meant it because they are seeing a gift in us that is just a light that illuminates everything around us, right? But we're unconscious of the competence that we have in that area. Mm. Yeah. And this is where we want to go in our study tonight with um, the understanding of the five patterns of tests. We want to become conscious and competent. Uh, if I asked you right now, um, this, first of all, about the understanding the five patterns, you, you may say, I know I don't know them that well, if you hadn't gone through the study uh, and the anointing that came forth through the trial and test of Bruce Wilkinson, because this is a package a set of tools that you don't find at Home Depot. This is a set of tools that you won't find all over the internet, not yet anyway, because this is pretty recent. And yet, um, so we, we know that we are incompetent. We know that we don't know these patterns that well. That's where we are. But we want to move tonight to where we know and we are competent in recognizing and enduring the tests of faith. Yeah. All right. So that's what we want to be. We want to be conscious and competent uh, into the patterns of tests of faith. But before we get to the patterns, let's talk about the components. <laughs> yeah, this is a whole lot built into this. And yet, um, that's why I'll go in a little bit deeper on Sunday. Uh, in the form of a worship experience as well. But I hope you can take pictures of these uh, so that you can go back and review them. Components of the test of faith. First Peter 6, 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, little while, we're going to see that that means temporary, if need be, if need be, means it may be necessary that you have been grieved by various trials. There are several trials. There are different types of trials. There are many. Why? That the genuineness of your faith, we said that earlier, being much more precious than gold. You know how much folks would do for uh, a ton of gold? 
but this is more precious than a ton of gold because the gold perishes. What we're talking about, even after these bodies, these vehicles are gone, it won't perish. Though it tests, it is tested by fire. Mm. Fire representing pain, uh, pain representing uh, that would hurt, which hurts. Yeah. Even though it's tested by fire, it may be found to may be found to praise, honor, and glory, all right, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is that scripture where we see, right? Also, um, we will be um we will rejoice, right? Um, in the here and now, right? Uh, that's the earthly reward. Uh, the genuineness of our faith will be verified. And then the heavenly reward, glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the glory Jesus will share with you and I as to the extent of our passing the test. Those words again, the tests of faith are for a little while. They're temporary. Uh, if need be, there's some things that need be that takes, that brings with it where we will grieve. They're necessary. And then various trials. There are a variety. So the test of faith, as we lift up those, remembering that grieving is a part of this uh, process, right? Um, we can remember that even though we grieve, the tests are temporary, tests are necessary, and they come in different ways. So let's talk about the tests of faith variables. Yeah, yeah, the tests of faith, and now I'm putting in that word variables. Look, at, and this is amazing when you think that hopefully this will open your eyes to the, all the different ways we receive tests. First, when? When is the test going to happen? right? Uh, the timing of the test of faith. Is it going to be tonight? Is it going to be while you're on this Bible study? Is it going to be soon as you get off? Is it going to be at midnight? Is it going to be at 3 a.m.? Is it going to be when you wake up? Is it going to be tomorrow? Is it going to be the next day? When? This is the variable of the uh, uh, test of faith. When is it going to happen, right? When will we, we be tested? Where? Location of your test. Is it going to happen at home? Is it going to happen at uh, Food Lion? Is it going to happen in Safeway? Is it going to happen in Costco? Is it going to happen uh, at work? Is it going to happen while you're driving? Where These tests, these are the variables. When it could happen at any time, where, at any place. Who? Who is going to experience or be a part of your test with you? right? Is it going to involve your spouse? Is it going to involve your children? Is it going to involve your siblings? Is it going to involve your co-worker? Is it going to involve a stranger? Yeah, all of these are variables in the variety of our tests. What? What category is the is this test of faith going to take? Is it going to be your physical body, right? Is something not going to be working as the way that it should? Is it going to involve pain on the physical body? Is it going to come from your heart uh, that that hurts and your brain picks it up, right? Uh, and this emotional distress, is it going to be on the inside, right, that we experience it? Is it going to be a test of our finances, right? Get the bill, get a uh, envelope in the mail, seemingly in, in in innocent. Open it up, IRS. You owe ten thousand dollars, right? Is it going to come that way? Is it going to be a, a test in your marriage, in your family, in your job, in your work situation? Is it going to be a test of overcoming a major failure? So you see the. When it can happen is various. Where it can happen can vary. Who it's a part of with you is variable, as well as what the particular category is. In addition to that, how much, Lord have mercy. And see, all of these are what we're going to be looking at when we look at the patterns. How long is the test going to be? 
you know, sometimes you're at a test. It's very short. It's at a red light, right? And uh, something happens to disturb your peace, right? Um, or you're just driving. And it's just for a moment that you can uh, pass the test or fail it in a few minutes. Uh, or it could be for a day, a week, a month, three months, three years, 30 years, 60 years. What is the length? How much? And what is the severity of it? How painful is it? Is, just, is it just nagging or does it cut to the core? And when you look at all of these, we get to the complexity of the test of faith. How deep are its roots? Pastor, uh, the bishop at the church we went to, he talked about that. He said, you know, some people come to the uh, altar and uh, they are relieved of one root problem. But the complexity of what they are being tested in, that they keep... Uh, uh, leaving without the joy of God's presence is not understanding how deep the complexity is. And it's more than just one thing. Yeah, how much? And then six, why? What is the why? We know the why. The why of the test, of when it happens, where it happens, who it happens with, what actually happens, how much um, is the length and the severity is for the transformation of your life to do what? Here's our earthly reward, to be more perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Mm. That's the earthly reward. So when we're complete on earth, we're living according to God's plan. We experience heaven in earthly bodies. And that is the here and now. And then there's our end. And to reward you with, here is the heavenly reward, Praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, heavenly and earthly rewards, tests of faith, the variables. And so when we get to the how, now we are getting to the heart of our lesson for tonight. These are the five patterns of how these tests show up. I want you to start thinking when we go through the five tests, which one you're resonating with now. Uh, uh, if you say that you're not resonating with one of them now, uh, then resonate, then tell me what you wrestled with last in the last uh, test. Most of us, however, can always identify a test. I used to preach from the, uh, the the place of we're either uh, in a storm, uh, coming out of a storm, or preparing for a storm. And I want to suggest that there's a test that uh, you can relate to in the present moment. Uh, and if not, you can relate to one you just came out of. I want you to start, and I want you to... Uh, Think of the number that you associate with the most. We're going to have five, whether it's number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Which one of these patterns is the one you are currently resonating with? All right. But before we do that, <laughs> we're going to talk about the cost to benefit comparison. What does that mean? Well, somebody might say, you know, when I think of uh, these tests, you know what? I'm, I, Lord, I wonder if anybody ever been there. Uh, the pain felt so bad. I said, Lord, if this is making me perfect, I don't want to be perfect. If it takes all this, I don't want the benefit. God, the costs seem too high for the benefit. Well... Let's take a look at it. This is what Paul said about the cost. Romans 8, 16 and 18. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit hmm, that we are children of God. Yeah, I want to give you, I want to pause right there and give you a picture of the spirit of our spirit and the spirit of of God. Bear witness with the Spirit himself, God's Spirit, 
bears witness to our spirit. I want to give you two images to take uh take a look at briefly so that you can get a glimpse of our spirit, our perception, and the uh, connection to God's spirit where these two combine. Let me show you this spirit. I want you to imagine, if you will, I'm going to share this picture here. Uh, let's do this. And I want you to imagine, this is all of us. I see, see the edge of the water there, little droplets, right? Trillions of droplets in the ocean. That's our spirit. Each of us has the spirit, the droplet, right? Uh, 0.00001% of the whole ocean, but the spirit that dwells within this vessel. And we can perceive life from our spirit. Uh, from from the droplet, yeah. In fact, you don't have to think about it all day long. Your mind is uh, giving renderings of a one droplet of what's coming from the heart, right? And so we can perceive it from that one droplet. Oh, guess what else? My mind. God says he will allow us to receive it uh, that we can perceive it from God's perspective. So that means that not only can we perceive it from the perspective of the droplet, but friends, we can perceive this whole uh, reality from the ocean perspective. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a minute. I can see an experience from my droplet. And yet God invites us into this life to experience it from the ocean perspective, from God's perspective. Say amen if you're with me or say, what do you mean, pastor? Take yourself off mute. Uh, say, say amen or say, what do you mean? Amen. amen. All amen. right. Okay. Amen. You see from the perspective of the droplet, and we all do it. God is hurt so much from the droplet. And God says, now I want you to perceive it from the ocean because you are part of me and I am the ocean. Lord have mercy. All right. Let's go back to, uh, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay. I think you had a hand raised. All right. Give give me one more second. I'll come right back. Uh or, or let the you know, hold on hold on. Uh, hold on to that thought, right? And right before we get into the five perspectives, don't lose the thought. Write it down, put it down somewhere. Uh, I want to go through the cost to benefit comparison because this might help with uh the question. We'll see. All right, so first we got this, right? This is what Paul said, right? Now, let's look at uh, what he says to the church in Cor Corinth. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Part of this transformation is taking uh experiencing a little bit more than our droplet to more droplets to we to we get into this place where we're part of the initiate to where we experience the ocean the, the the very perception that God wants us to see we are being transformed there it is into the same image from what glory to glory test to test just as by the spirit of the lord all right. God is doing this. It's not something that uh, is just happening. So let's take a look at the cost benefit. Look at, we're going to have look at two perspectives, right? Uh, perspective from the droplet, from the ocean. <laughs> from our, right, uh, perspective and God's perspective. And I'm going to add two words here in a minute. Uh, we're going to add the word our temporary perspective because that's how the droplet perceives things into God's eternal perspective. That's how God sees it. God just doesn't see the moment. God sees eternity. But from our perspective, 
our temporal perspective, we have one way of looking at the cost benefit comparison, and God has one way of looking at the cost benefit comparison from an eternal perspective. For us, often the cost, right, to benefit, the cost seems way too high in the moment, right? The cost seems higher. It seems more than the benefit that we're receiving. Sometimes from the droplet, we can experience that. And we're going to see that we're not the first ones. We say, it's not worth it, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, we would rather just go through the pain that we uh, bring upon ourselves than the ones that God calls us to pass. Lord, have mercy. Mm. From God's perspective, the cost is low <laughs> compared to the benefit. In fact, Paul said, "I, you can't even compare the two because the benefit is exponentially higher than the temporary cost. He says when we get to a full understanding of the benefit, it's not even a comparison to the cost. Mm -hmm. It's definitely worth it. Those who have grabbed the bar, who have gone to that place of uh saying, this is my perspective, it hurts, I recognize it, and yet, God, I see your perspective, so I'm going to endure. Those who have been initiated into passing the test, right, of accepting, surrendering the droplet for the ocean, surrendering the part to the whole, surrendering our temporary understanding to God's eternal understanding, get to that place to say, yeah, the benefits can't be compared to the temporary cause. All right, we're getting ready to lean into the patterns of faith, but let me pause for just a moment. Let's see those hands. Where are those hands? We're doing good on time tonight. Yeah. How we, who, who has a hand? Who has a comment, an aha, a reflection, a praise, or a question? All right, where were you? Well, maybe that answered it for you. Now we're going to transition into the five components. All right, uh, the five patterns. It's going to be five patterns, right? Um, and what he does a masterful job. You know, this is a Wesleyan study because in Wesley, we know that the Word of God. Uh, is the primary component that we uh, work out our soul salvation. There is four things that Wesley lifted up and uh, the scripture is primary. Then our experience, right, helps us. Um, our uh, tradition helps us. And those, uh, what's the fourth one? Uh, uh, our scripture experience reason our brain helps us and so you when when you hear me talking about the brain uh the brain is meant to uh to the mind is meant to help us we just get it twisted and we build the brain around the temporary instead of building building the brain around the eternal lord have mercy that's when the brain is being misappropriated yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we can't see the sky mm. because of the temporary clouds. We can't see the blue. We can't see it because the mind, we've accepted the rendering from the temporary instead of the rendering from the eternal. Well, now we're going to give five different patterns that we can find ourselves in. And uh, these patterns are not in order. Right. These are just five patterns. Uh, you may be in three. You may be in one. And most of us have experienced some of these patterns, but it, it's not a sequential um, occurrence. At any time, one of these parent, these tests, these patterns can begin or uh, conclude. 
and he's going to do a great job. I want you to look. He's he gives reference, scriptural reference to individuals, initiates that have gone through this and they've done exactly what we've done. Some of them had, you know, imagine the droplet saying to the ocean. Why? Right. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah. Isn't that what we do? The droplet speaks back to the ocean as if we got a clue to the context that God has. All right, let's lean in. We're going to lean into session two now, and I'm going to bring it up to, uh, yeah, we're doing great. Okay, so we'll have time at the end to bring this back, but let's go ahead and lean into uh, uh, Bruce Wilkinson. He does a masterful job into these five, pay attention to the five tests, pay attention to uh, where you currently are or where you're coming out of hmm. and uh, see which number resonates with you. Here we go. Yeah. Hmm. Started and I just need somebody to come off mute. So I know that it's coming through clear for you. Uh-oh. I didn't hear that. Uh-oh. What is connected? Something's connected. Let me go to my sound here. Hmm. My mind. About this and then, about this and then. Revolutions you in your life that you will love. I think I just fixed it. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. You will love it. All right, here we go. Not only now, but forever. You got to let go of the old lie. The old lie is it's not worth it. The new truth is it's definitely worth it the people who get here are the same people who count all joy when this happens and who rejoice when this happens do you can you put it together they know the truth that 90 something percent of all the believers think the opposite you got to grab this let me go over here to these take a look at this back here these first two are the elementary issues we're dealing with. The next two sessions, the stages in the test failure, this is intermediate. This is going to be much more challenging than this. This is just, hello, let's begin to get the big idea. And the steps for test success are going to give you tools that you've never used probably before in your life. So you don't fail the test anymore, that you let it perfect you and that the test finishes. You got to understand, you got to buy into the biblical teaching. It's been there all along, but we just haven't perhaps ever got it clear in our own mind. All right, let's move on. The patterns of tests of faith. Okay, I've picked out very clear biblical passages about these five patterns and also given them a name and expressed how we feel about them and then given you a little animation and a sound that goes with them about a way for you to remember it. This is how I remember it. Let's take a look at this passage. So Sarah said to Abraham, so this is Sarah and Abraham, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Remember what God did? He promised Abraham and Sarah they would have as many children as the stars in heaven, the end of the sea. They didn't have any children. And by the time she's saying this, it's uh, Abraham is um, 86 years old. Wait, wait, wait. Is she overstating this? 
Is she, is she, is she overstating this? See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Is that true? Or was it just something physical? Or was it Satan? <laughs> or was it God? Oh my goodness, it's God. It's called the test. God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah, and they kept trying to have children for weeks, months, <laughs> year after year, after year, after year, after year, oh man, after year, after year, yeah, but that's the whole point, isn't it? God wouldn't let them have kids, and he's the one who promised it to them. Was God withholding this? Yes, absolutely, you'll find out he was the one who did this. Why? To test their faith in his promise when everything looks like his promise isn't going to work. Does God ever do that to you, my friend? <laughs> what, is it, what does it feel like when this thing goes on and on and on and on? This is called the prolonged marathon. That's pattern number one. A marathon is a race that, oh man, I used to run a lot in high school and college. And you, you run, let's say, a marathon, you think it's never going to end. It goes on and on and on. And our definition is it's a long-lasting, difficult, or painful situation. But the key concept is it's long-lasting. It seems to never end. So normal response is it's too long. It's too long. This will never end. That's how you feel. It goes on and on and on, and it goes on. Watch this now. You're kind of thinking, it'll end it, it, by here. I'm sure, you know, next week. And then it goes on some more and say, well, you know, I think it's, it's going to end. It's going to end pretty soon, and it doesn't. And it's, I thought by now he'd be over. Where's God? No, oh, too long. Can you identify with this? Of course you can. Marathon. It goes on and on and on, and we feel like it's too long. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be your name, and I will bless her. Notice this words. And I will bless her, and I also give you a son by her. I give you. I give you, Abraham. It's not you, it's me. I'm going to give her a, a son. Not a daughter, a son. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Oh, man. Why on earth you got to put this together, my friends? Who's making this so long? God. To be abusive? Absolutely not. Here's how it looks. It goes on and on and on. So when you think about marathon, it goes on and on and on. That's your picture. It's an arrow and that sound drones on and on and on. All right. Pattern number one, the prolonged marathon. No more responses. It's too long. Pattern number two, back to the same couple. They finally have Isaac, their son. And his son is probably in his early mid-teens, most theologians feel, when this happened. And God says, he says to him, take now your son. Now listen to how God sets up Abraham. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love. Oh, mine alive. Take that one. And go to the land of Moriah 
and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I'll tell you. And then you remember as Abraham's about ready to do this, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, don't lay your hand on the ladder. Do anything to him for now. I know. Not you know. But I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Was this a marathon? Absolutely not. This was something that's extremely painful. This was called a severe crisis. It was a crisis. It was an extremely painful or difficult situation. What's our normal response to a crisis? Kaboom! It's just too hard. It's too hard. Have you had a crisis? Where did you think God was? Hmm. Look at this next passage. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested. What? <laughs> Come on, you got to put one and one together. By faith. What is this? What is the trial? It's a test of faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested by whom? By God. Session one, God tests everyone. God's been testing you. Man, have you misinterpreted God. When he tested, offered up Isaac, who, and he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said. Now, this is a powerful verse. In Isaac, your seed shall be called, look at these words, concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead, even from the dead. So Abraham's faith had grown so strong over all these tests, and we could have given you many more tests of Abraham. He had so many. That when he was going to kill his son in obedience to God, right? He concluded by faith that if he dies, God's going to resurrect him because he promised through this son that the nation shall be blessed and I'll have many, many children. Therefore, God has to raise him from the dead. And don't even doubt it. He's going to raise him from the dead. Look at that faith. Oh, my goodness. Was that there at the beginning? No, it wasn't. Oh, man, mm -hmm. man. Come on now. Come on now. You got to put this together, my friends. Your faith from God's point of view in him should become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until it's immovable. God is good. I trust him. This is for my good. I believe the cost is little compared to the benefit. I will praise his name. Nothing can make me go to the left or the right or retreat or back up or quit. Ah, that's when the heavens of glory shout your name. Yes, that's when God, Christ stands up as he did with Stephen being stoned. Christ stands up. He's proud of him. Look at my son. He never wavers with me. Ah, oh, the marathon, on and on and on and on. The crisis, severe. It's making sense to you? Come on, we're just like all the famous people in the Bible, aren't we? Why? Why are we? Because God wants us all to be perfect, mature, lacking nothing. And he uses the trials and the tests of faith to do it to you and to me. And he used the same patterns that he's on Abraham and Isaac. And Here it is. Look at that. Kaboom. <laughs> Severe. Kaboom. Crisis, it's too hard. Number three, this is when Moses is leading the people through the wilderness. So Moses said, listen to the anguish. Come on now, the anguish. I've said, I think, three times now. Trials are grievous. They're painful. They're difficult, especially the marathon, especially the crisis. 
but it gets even more difficult. This is one with Moses that's more difficult than the first two. And look how Moses is suffering at this point. Moses says to God, why? (laughs) You hear that why word? That's a person who's about ready to fail a test. When you ask why, you're failing your test because you're not believing that God's purposes are good for you and this is going to be worth it and this is from his loving hand and there's no reason to doubt him and you're not going backwards. You're not quitting. You're not. You're not. No. You are strong in faith. And man, what you do with your life is dependent on the faith that grows in you. The mighty in faith do mighty exploits for God. And you become mighty through tests of faith. And those tests of faith are with trials. And they follow a pattern. They're either, you know, a marathon, a crisis, or the rest of them are about ready to get to. Listen to the why. Why have you afflicted your servant? Question, did God afflict Moses? Absolutely he did. <laughs> yes. Tests of faith are from God. And why, there it is again, look at that. Why have I not found favor in your sight? (laughs) You know, I've been serving you. I've been working for you. Well, why are you treating me this way? You see what we're thinking that way? We're thinking so backwards. So backwards. We're thinking this is a punishment. (laughs) It's not a punishment. It's God's pathway to perfection. It's God's road to becoming like Christ is to go through these. Why have you done this to me? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you've laid this burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I forget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian cares a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to all these people for they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we should eat? Uh, Here it is. Here it is. I am not able. <laughs> I've decided I'm not able. That's my, my decision. I am not able. I am not able to bear all these people alone as if God's not there. I thought these were God's people, Moses. They're not your people. You're taking responsibility on you. I've never asked you to do that. Because the burden, uh uh-huh, is too heavy? Really? It is? Come on, Moses. I'm right here. It's too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, (laughs) please kill me here now. I want to die. That's a person at the end of pattern three. What's pattern number three? The ordeal. The ordeal, painful or difficult event or situation with long-lasting consequences. Whoa. It starts severe, hard, and then continues on and 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 on. That's what it is. It's both the marathon and the crisis blended into one. And the normal response is, this is just too much. This is just too much. Take a look at how this looks. There is my crisis, and there is my marathon. Ordeals are difficult. I'm in an ordeal with my stroke. Was it a crisis? Oh, my goodness. And it's gone on 10 months, and it's likely unless God decides to do a miracle, which is up to him, but he's heard me and many of our family and friends knocking at the door. It would be terrific if you decided to heal him, but if not, it's okay. We trust you. You're good. It's an ordeal. But have I ever been at this place where Moses was? Yes. Was Paul ever here? Yes. He says, I despaired even of life. Is it okay with you? Oh, boy, hold on. Is it okay with you that God pushes you in your test of faith beyond where you think it's fair? It's not fair to go past here. 
It can't last this long. It can't be this hard. Don't you know I serve you? I love you. It can't keep going on, can it? Because is not this the place in which new faith grows? It's always the leaves that happen at the end of the branch. New leaves and new twigs come. They come out here. It's a new growth. And it goes past what you think is going to happen. It's because of your expectations and your assumptions. I think by now this is going to end next week. It's going to end, I'm sure, by next Friday. This, this, and God says, you do, huh? How about I'm not to the finish yet of giving you my gift? Where do you find out what I'm going to give you when you get to the other side of glory because of this? The ordeal. <laughs> this is just too much. Number four. This surprised me. This is the pattern that the most people voted is where they were at the time I was teaching this to them. I had them vote. Is it marathon? Is it crisis? Is it ordeal? Is it this one or number five? This got the most votes. I did not expect this. Take a look at this. This is the book of Job. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. This is Job. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And when the Sabaeans raided them and took them all away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That's the first thing that happened. That'd be enough to knock anybody over. While he was still speaking, you can't miss this. Another one of his servants also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned the sheep and the servants and consumed them. They're all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you, while he was speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away. They killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on young people and they are all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, there's much we could say about this, but I want you to see the conclusion of this for this session. We'll come back to Job later on in the series. Then Job, I was so, what's the best word? Desperately humbled at what Job did here. It just is, you talk about a person whose faith cannot be shaken. Job arose tore his robe, shaved his head, every, everything he's owned, plus all of his kids, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground, and he, oh, man, <laughs> he worshiped. How could a man worship after this? Answer, look at his perspective. Then he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Ah, come on now. Think about what you're reading. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has all the rights in the world to do whatever he wants, to give me great blessings or to take it away from me. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. What is this called? This is called the cluster. One after the other, after the other, after the other. Multiple difficult or painful events or situations often quickly occurring one after the other. The normal response is, it's too many. It's too many. Where's God? Where's God? If God was a God of love, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. Uh, how? Where is God? I thought he loved me. I thought he cared for me. I thought he was there for me. Woo. What did I do wrong? Answer, you probably did nothing wrong. It's a huge gift. Take, 
heed of the packaging your gift comes. It's not the packaging, it's the gift is inside the packaging. Here's what it looks like. Boom. The cluster. Very difficult. It's too many. And the last one. Is this helpful? You're getting words? What's the one that goes on and on and on? Yeah, a marathon. What's the crisis? What's the ordeal? What's the cluster? Got it? Marathon, crisis, ordeal, cluster. And this last one is an issue that God sees that you either failed the test in this area of faith and he gives it to you again, and <laughs> you fail it. He gives it to you again, over and over again. Or the other side of it is, you pass it, but your faith isn't strong enough, and he makes it harder the next time, and he makes it hard again. But it's the same principle of tests, not because you failed, but because he wants you to become stronger. You remember how many times Saul tried to kill David over and over again? And this is David said to Saul, who was right there to kill him, why do you listen to the words of your men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave. Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. And while he was there, he took off his robe and didn't know that David and part of his army was in the same cave. Someone, David said, urged me to kill you because he's right there and helpless. But my eye spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed, and I don't have the authority to go above God in killing him. Moreover, my father, see, I've cut the corner of your robe in my hand. And he <laughs> Can you imagine Saul in front of his army? Everybody realized, oh, man, that's a part of Saul's. Look at, look at the bottom of his robe. Oh, man, while he was in there. Oh, you're kidding. David could have killed him, and he didn't. What was that? That's another one of those tests that David was being given by God. It wasn't the first time or the second time. The corner of your robe and didn't kill you. No one see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hands shall not be against you. Look at this. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me. I shall not be against you. What was that? That was a test of faith. Faith of David in God, even though a man kept trying to kill him, and he was innocent. So what is this called? This is called the repetitive loop. <laughs> on and on and on. Retake of past tests, but in a different event or situation. What's the normal response? <laughs> Too often, I've been here before. You got it? Here's what it looks like. Part three, I want to conclude with a very helpful issue. Next to each one of these five patterns, I gave you two words. Too long, too hard, too much, too many. What's the word too mean? T-O-O. -O. It's too long. It should have ended back here. Question I want to ask you about this. Um... Where along the line do we decide to? If we have this, um, I have to endure, right? We don't sit down and say to ourselves, man, I'm in a trial, I'm in a test of faith, and um, I think it's going to be over in three weeks, um, three weeks, two days, and 14 hours. We don't do that. But somewhere on the line, what do we end up saying? It's too long. Well, who put the line there? 
This, you know, God doesn't send us an email or a text or a WhatsApp and says, by the way, next week on um, Thursday afternoon, 2.12, 2 I'm going to begin your test, and it's going to last for 14 days. And um, on the 14th day at 9.23, somebody's going to come to your house, and it's going to end. So hang in there. What will you do? You'll go to that day. Why? You have your expectation set. What does God do? <laughs> he doesn't tell you when the test is coming, how long it's going to be, which of the patterns is it. He doesn't tell you anything. Well, then how do we get to this point? It's too long or too hard or too much or too many. How do we get to that point? Because somewhere, this making sense to you? Somewhere, we have this um, kind of this dotted line right here. It should end by here. But we don't even know that line is there, do we? Because we've not thought about it. But here's what happens. We have a subconscious ending point. And when this thing continues to go past that point, that's where it goes to too hard, too long, too much. God, you put too much on me. As if God made a mistake. And this issue then is where we begin the fall of the failure. And eventually, if it goes on enough past this place, what do we begin doing about God? How do we feel about God? Because he went too much this time. It was too hard. He wasn't fair. He wasn't loving. He wasn't good. Why should I serve God if he's going to treat me this way? Whoa! That goes all back to here. Watch this. Watch this. What would happen if you said, no, um... I'm, I'm not going to have any expectations. I, I don't know when this is going to be. It's okay with me as long as it lasts, as hard as it lasts, as complex as it lasts. It's fine with me. I know it has an end, and the end is for my good, and I will trust you, and I won't have any expectations. Therefore, are you going to get to the two part? You're not. What is that called? <laughs> Dependence, submission. It's okay. I don't have to know. I don't know. It's okay with me not to know. I know you. I know you. I know your ways. And you are generous and kind to me, even if you wrap it in a trial. So I've put a little bit of a chart for you as we wrap this up. The danger of expectations, our expectations, and our assumptions. It's going to end by here. Is this helpful to you? This really is meant to be part of the foundation of understanding of how this takes place. This is our expectations. This is reality down this blue line is the reality that we're in. And we've been expecting this to come through. We've expecting reality to get better. You know, we improve. It's going to end. Yeah, we can do, you know. And the further time goes on, and our expectations stay here, and this line of reality doesn't get better, and our expectations aren't met, guess what we begin to feel? More and more serious words. For instance, number one, when this isn't that far apart, level number one, is called disappointment. Do you know what the definition of disappointment is? Listen carefully. It's defined in the dictionary as to fail, to live up to expectations. You ever been to a restaurant? And at the way out, you say to your friend you're out to dinner with, well, that was disappointing. What did you mean? I expected it to taste better than it did. You can't be disappointed unless you have an expectation. Wow. But what happens if time goes on further and further and the expectations don't change and reality doesn't change? You get a much more challenging word. You get discouragement. Discouragement. What's discouragement? Take a look at this. Take the word, the, the letters D-I-S out of here. Courage. D-I-S means a lack of or absence of. I have an absence of courage. Courage about what? That my life's going to get better. 
That's discouragement. What's all that based on? Your line of expectation. Who told you to set that? <laughs> if it's based upon a promise of God, have that expectation because God keeps his promise. Making sense? Well, now it becomes a little bit more challenging. Because if time goes on, look at level three. Disillusionment. Oh, this is a lot more serious. Look, what's, what's the word in the middle of disillusionment? Take out the D-I-S and the mint. It's illusion. What's an illusion? It's a false sense of reality. If you have an illusion, you have a false sense of reality. You're not living in real world. When you're disillusionment, it means, watch this, I no longer have an illusion. What was my illusion over here? My illusion was reality is going to get better, and it didn't. <laughs> and guess what? God stopped it from getting better. And he doesn't appreciate you drawing your line in the sand, telling him by now this should be over. Really? When a person becomes disillusioned, that's the time for this line to disappear. Lord, I submit to you, for as long, as hard, and complex as you want, I trust you, and when it's complete, it will end. Next one is the word depression. Depression, that's when we get angry, can get bitter toward God. Level number five, despair. What's despair? The loss of all hope. That's what definition of despair is. What are you despairing? I'm despairing that my life will ever get what I want it to be. Wait, wait, wait. It's not what I want it to be. It's what God wants you to go through. Level six, desperation. And number seven, defeat. So, so much of this, if you can just put this together, is our expectations we don't really realize this, but here's what we do. If this is the Lord, we go above the Lord. <laughs> you'll, you'll be done by this time. It won't get any harder than this, because if it does, it's not fair. And if you were loving, you wouldn't do this to me. Do you realize this? It's arrogant. God doesn't want us having expectations on him that's not based upon what the Bible says or gives him freedom to, to live sovereignly with us. All right, let's wrap it up. The five patterns for the tests of faith. Let's go through this in your workbook. I want you to know these five words now. Here we go. Number one, the marathon. Number two, the crisis. Number three, the ordeal. Number four, the cluster. And number five, the loop. Now, how do you feel about this? This has been kind of some uh, challenging topics to think about. But I want you to ponder this thought as we wrap up. The Lord selects the optimal pattern for your test. If there was a better pattern for him to achieve his perfect purpose for you, he would have selected it. So take a look at these principles. Number one, the Lord is omniscient, all-knowing, and always selects the best test pattern for your maximum present and eternal benefit. Benefit. Point number two, the Lord is omnipotent, all-powerful, and always arranges every part of your test with the highest efficiency and effectiveness. And number three, the Lord is omnipresent and always remains with you during every test with his help and his comfort. Well, that wraps up the patterns of tests of faith. In our next session, we're going to deal with the stages in test failure as we wrap up this particular session in the testing of your faith. All right, friends, I'm going to leave you with the questions to ponder and go ahead and put in your chat. 
and uh, see if um, you related to one of those four while I pull up the um, pull up the homework as well as those five again. Let's see if I can pull up those five. All right, oops, going too fast. So those five, the marathon lasts so long, the crisis, yeah, too hard, uh, the ordeal, the cluster, and the loop. Uh, which one of these are you, uh, would you gravitate toward, hit towards now that you, you test you're in? Notice that he said when at the taping of this, the group that he was in, they uh, identified with the cluster. Uh, someone asked for, let me bring that back up um, to, they wanted to see the uh, words as well. Let me bring up that, um, see if I can bring up that screen that had the words as well. Uh, I had it on a different slide. Let me see. Um, but for the sake of time, I may have to uh, go on for now and go right to the homework. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that at my fingertips. So let me go to the homework and share that. Okay, here we go. Um, share, here we go. This is what I want you to ponder. In addition to everything else you heard, go ahead and take a picture of that. So go ahead and sketch out the main chart of this session with the five arrows uh, from the marathon, uh, marathon to the crisis, to the uh, ordeal, to the cluster, and then to the um, loop. Sketch out the chart, including how we often respond in each of these patterns. Go ahead and put too long or too much or too many or too hard, right? Review together until you can repeat all five key patterns in order and then review the session one chart. Two, think back over your life and share with uh, uh share with others or write it down in your journal one difficult test of faith you experienced which pattern was it how did you feel during the process respond most of us can identify with the words it's just not worth it when enduring a test of faith come on somebody describe how the cost to benefit charge chart may challenge your thinking in that area. And then lastly, nearly everyone, yeah, identifies with the loop pattern when the Lord reteaches and retests us. Hmm. Come on. Because we repeatedly fail his tests. Common loops focus on our finances, broken relationships, and our response to authority. Describe one loop in your life. What do you want to tell the Lord about it? So there is your homework. Um, uh, Candace, if you would just stay on to get some responses um, and you can share with me a little later as to, uh, uh, if, if you can, just for a few minutes, just for the next five minutes, uh, if you identify with a um, category, share it. And one thing that you're taking away, one way that God either blessed you or challenged you, or maybe both, share that. Um, and I will put that, oh, I, okay, marathon and ordeal. 
Yeah, ordeal. Yeah, um, some of you have already done that. And uh, share one thing that you're taking away that God has blessed you with tonight. I'm jumping over to our other Bible study, and I want to make uh, Candace the host for this. And uh, Candace, you can share with me later. Uh, stay encouraged. I look forward to hearing um, what God has taught you tonight and therefore what we can learn together. We'll see you later.